Good morning and uh, welcome to the IISSS uh, Washington office. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Nigel Inkster. I'm the director of transnational threats and political risk in our London headquarters. And I'm also a retired intelligence officer in, in recovery. Um, <laughs> unlike our, our guest speaker today, who is uh, a former intelligence officer who's gone back into the business at the very top echelon, Dr. Gregory Treverton has for some months now been serving as uh, chairman of uh, the United States National uh, Intelligence Council. And I can think of few people uh, better qualified for the task. Uh, Gregory has, uh, for, for a number of years, been working in the RAND Corporation, uh, looking uh, uh, at and writing about um, the issues and problems of practicing the craft of intelligence and intelligence analysis. Uh, I'm not going to try and list all the uh, output that uh, he has generated during this period. But suffice to say that he's had lots of uh, time and opportunity to think about uh, all of these issues and, and now, again, to, to put them into practice, which I think is, is really great. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, in, in the modern world, um, the role of intelligence in the practice of, of, straight, of, of statecraft um, a bit like uh, what Clausewitz said about war, the, the nature of intelligence work is arguably unchanging, but its character has, I think, changed very substantially uh, in recent years, particularly with the advent of modern information communications technologies, and uh, which, which have uh, transformed um, information from a commodity that uh, not long ago was uh, scarce, expensive, and conferred considerable power on those who had it, to a commodity which is cheap and ubiquitous. Um, and that um, also uh, has raised all kinds of uh, different public expectations uh, about um, what the what public should know about intelligence whenever any major um, um, issue of ent international relations makes it into the media nowadays. One of the first uh, sets of questions that uh, the media tend to raise is what was the information on which this decision was based, who knew what, when, etc., etc. Um, interesting to reflect that in 1945, when uh, the operation at Bletchley Park that successfully broke the German Enigma um, encryption system, um, was brought to an end, um, the very existence of that capability um, was maintained, the, the secrecy of it was maintained for 30 years, in 1975 when the story first started to come out. I, I question whether in today's world it would be possible to keep a secret like that for you know, thir 30 minutes. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, the, 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 this is a very, in, in some ways a very new world that we live in, uh, and yet some of the key decisions that policymakers have to take are going to be based on intelligence, which is not, by definition, going to be in the public domain, but is closer, perhaps, to the surface of policymaking than I suspect it's uh, it's ever been. Um, so I'm going to invite uh, Gregory to, to talk to us now for some you know, 20 plus minutes, at the end of which time we will uh, have a question answer session, um, which I'll, I'll moderate. Uh, I do want to finish uh, roughly on time because um, Gregory has another appointment. We need to be out of the building by you know, 11.40 at the latest, so I'll keep an eye on the time. Uh, having said that, um, um, without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Gregory. Well, thanks, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here. This is actually my first time in this uh, IISS headquarters here. As many of you knew, I uh, sort of grew up with the ISS in London. Very formative a couple of periods in my life, so I think fondly about those days in London often. It's a pleasure to be here, a pleasure to see so many old friends. What I thought I'd do, with, do this very informally is talk a little bit about intelligence and policy as it affects my work, the work of the National Intelligence Council, then talk a bit about what's on our agenda, and then conclude with a couple of the big challenges that seems to be intelligence and including the big face. 
I always assume that everybody should know what the National Intelligence Council uh, NIC is and does. Probably that's not a safe assumption. So I should say just a few words about that. I should say that uh, you can win a bet here in Washington. Uh, since while the NIC hasn't been a CIA organization for 40 years, uh, everybody still thinks it is because we sit in CIA headquarters. So if you get somebody to bet about who the NIC reports to, you could probably win that bet. We are the uh, Director of National Intelligence's arm for substance. We're an interagency group. We bring together good insiders, but also uh, outsiders, insiders from all of various intelligence agencies, as national intelligence officers and deputy national intelligence officers, organized like uh, State Department, regionally and functionally, we are about uh, 100 analysts, 150 total people. So if a senior policymaker wants to know what the CIA thinks about a particular issue, they can ask that, or what DIA thinks. If they want to know what the intelligence community thinks, what are the agreements and disagreements across the community on an analytic issue, that's us. They come to us. The big change in the nature of, uh, well, two big changes that strike me coming back I was vice chairman of the NIC uh, more than 15 years ago, so I'm a very slow riser. <laughs> uh, uh, but the two, the two big changes in intelligence policy relations that strike me coming back and affect my daily work, one is how much more embedded intelligence is in the policy process than when I left. I think that's probably mostly the artifact of 15 years of fighting wars, unhappily, you can make policy about intelligence, but it's hard to fight a war without intelligence. So that has embedded, I think, intelligence very much in the process. Technology helps uh, in the sense that I see every day a stream of email back and forth between national intelligence officers and NSC staffers that is absolutely continuous, never stops, back and forth all the time. So the embedding is there. The second big change is related to that, and that is when I was at the uh, NIC before, we did almost exclusively strategic intelligence. Not necessarily really long range, but <coughs> intelligence that tried to put current issues in a broader and sometimes longer context. Now we're, uh, that's still, I still regard that as the main <coughs> mission, but now we're very deeply engaged in current intelligence. We do the intelligence preparation for the principles committee meetings, that is the cabinet officers meeting about major foreign policy issues, and more important, the deputies committee meetings, which are their deputies, the group that is sort of the key policy making body on foreign policy in the US government, the place where analyses get presented, arguments get had, and issues get teed up for decisions, one hopes, by the, by the principals and ultimately by the president. So last year, we did I think something like 700 pieces of paper. About half of those were particular memorandums signed by particular national intelligence officers going to Susan Rice or Tony Blinken or Avril Haines or another uh, senior policymaker. Those mostly came out of the conversations at the PCs and DCs. So that, that really drives our process. It means that we spend a, an awful lot of time in hot accounts, like the Middle East or like Russia. Uh, the, the DC meets DC meets <coughs> some issue virtually every day, including Saturday. Uh, and so the stream of for the hot accounts, like the Middle East or like Russia, the uh, stream of responding, going to meetings, following up, is really a, a full-time job. The good news about it is we're there. We're in the middle of the, we're up to our neck in it. We're valued. Uh, we know what's going on. When I was at the NIC uh, many long years ago, we sometimes worried about our relevance. Well, no, no worries about relevance now. We're up to our eyeballs in relevance. Rather, the, uh, the challenge, and the challenge for me and my colleagues, is to have the space, time, attention to do more strategic pieces, to try and uh, help people raise their sights a bit, look around the corner a little bit, see connections across issues. Now, many of the, not many, but some of the 
requests that come to us from the Memphis committee meetings are, are get us into a strategic level. They'll ask a question like, if we do X, how will Putin respond? What will be the effect on his inner circle? Just, to, just the kind of conversation that I think intelligence and policy should have. The challenge, of course, one of my uh, deputy NIOs for Russia, who's a terrific guy, uh, did this uh, paper, more strategic paper. He said, afterward, I really enjoyed doing this strategic look. I had six hours. So six hours of deep strategic <laughs> thought is probably not ideal, uh, but sometimes it's the, the best we can do. So the, the challenge is, and there tends to be a cycle. I, I'm struck by the cycle of policymaking on Ukraine that once Russia walked into Crimea, then the, the first round of policy was entirely tactical sanctions, how do we keep the coalition together, how do we build a coalition of sanctions. Then after a time period, the deputies began asking questions like, well, where are we, where are we going? How, what's, a, what's an outcome we might reasonably aspire to that would be uh, sensible? And that then spawned a set of work uh, for us trying to answer those questions, frame some of the alternatives. Uh, so the, 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 the challenge over and over again for me is to, uh, is to try and provide space and opportunity for more strategic analysis. I think it's important for the NIC, since that is its historic mission, to be the intelligence community's leader in uh, strategic analysis. That's all the more true, I think, these days when after 15 years of war fighting, the capability in any of the agencies to do strategic analysis has waned, and therefore trying to uh, be both a doer of strategic analysis and a cheerleader for it, I take to be a, a central to my tasks. Well, in terms of agenda, um, obviously the current agenda is dominated by the set of crises that's out there. I was giving an after dinner speech my second week on the job six months ago, and uh, I said uh, my entire career I studiously avoided the Middle East. I said, that's over, or as the kids would say, that's so over. Uh, sometimes I feel like I do all ISIL all of the time. Um, so the, the, the current agenda is dominated, obviously, by the current crises. Uh, therefore, our challenge, it seems to me, is not only to do strategic analysis, but to be somewhat strategic in our approach. So if I had to list my top longer-term issues, they would be China and its surroundings in Asia, cyber, and Europe probably more or less in that order. I think it's important for us then to keep uh, reminding people that uh, while ISIL is um, <coughs> a nasty nuisance and pol the politics mean we're required to respond, uh, in the long run it's not an existential threat to the United States. Uh, it's, it'll be followed by yet another terrorist splinter group uh, and so some perspective is hard, obviously, uh, particularly in a town like this, where uh, the politics of the moment do dominate uh, important foreign policy. But that makes it all the more important, I think, for us to, to try and push out uh, analyses that uh, are more strategic, that help to provide some sense of balance or priority. And we know that those kinds of analyses aren't likely to be demanded by policy makers, they would like them, and in principle they'd like them, but they're too busy to, to ask for them, and so we probably have to push some um, to get that work out. I'm happy to talk more about uh, any of the issues and uh, priorities at the NIC, but let me conclude so we can turn this into a conversation with just a couple of big challenges that I think the intelligence community and we face. Uh, one is big data. We're obviously into an era of big data. Many of us grew up in uh, intelligence when data was a problem. There was too little data. Now data is ubiquitous. Right? When you have uh, uh, street corner cameras on every street corner, uh, everybody's cell phone is locating them all the time. When uh, biometrics is getting better, facial recognition software is getting better too. <coughs> when your car has colleagues remind me, something like 22 separate emitters. Uh, so data is out there. We're awash in data. Um, 
And that, and I think, obviously, is a challenge for us, but it's a, a great opportunity as well, it seems to me. It, it's, uh, it means that we need to recruit different sorts of people. The CI has now built a data analyst track, which is exactly right. And we're trying to figure out uh, how to make use of big data. It obviously, it takes you into all of the problems of big data, access, privacy, and all those issues. Uh, but I think two things about it. One is, I hope, my hope for it in the current state of technology is not that we're going to uh, get warning by putting together big data sets, social media, and the like. But I hope we can actually get tips. We'll get interesting correlations. Some of them will be spurious. But if we get some interesting correlations, we might be able to say to analysts, take a look here. Or maybe you should think about these two things as connected in a way you haven't thought of already. I also think this era does then take us uh, and may usefully disrupt what seems to me to be a pretty tired and very linear intelligence cycle. We're so used to a cycle of intelligence that starts with the requirements, then says we collect against the requirements, then we analyze what we've collected, and then we disseminate. One wags and uh, collect, write, disseminate, repeat. Uh, um, and that may have been OK, except when we know that it, it's, a, it's partly a fiction in any case, but it may have been OK as a kind of paradigm during the Cold War when you had a slow moving single target. It seems to me it can't be right now. And so the era of big data does let us do correlations. It suggests uh, that we may know the answer before we know the question. We may collect, we have collected the answer before we precisely know why that bit of information turns out to be useful. And it takes us away from a paradigm that's entirely driven by collection. You know, we, always, we always ask, after every product, were there collection gaps? Uh, and that, that's always seemed to me to be a little silly. Sometimes I want to ask, maybe there was a thought gap, right? <laughs> but, but our temptation is always to collect more. And we know that anything we collect is only going to be a teeny fraction of the data that's out, that's out there. The world's awash in data. Uh, and so um, being less driven by, uh, by collection, I think, is, uh, is also to the good. It requires lots of changes in habits and work styles and even people we recruit, but it is, it seems to me, uh, the future. The second, and here I'll conclude, the other big change, obviously, is transparency. All those technologies that make big data available also make transfer a very transparent world. That has obvious implications for cover and how we do all of that. I, on that score, I sometimes think we're like the old Roadrunner. Remember the Roadrunner cartoons where Roadrunner didn't fall till he looked down. We're off the cliff and probably haven't quite yet looked down, but we will at some point. <clears throat> uh, so a whole set of issues about that. Uh, but I also think transparency can be a little bit will challenge us because increasingly in this transparent world, policymakers are going to want a 24-7 conversation with their intelligence analysts <coughs> on their iPads. Uh, and that's, we're a long way from that, but we can't be very far from it in time because it's going to happen. It's going to happen. I think it's a good thing. But it means we have to think of, for instance, quality control in a very different way, where the quality control then gets embedded in the analyst, not in the product. We're used to review processes and look at products. It means now we'll have to trust analysts to, uh, to answer on the fly with a particular policymaker. I think that's the direction we're moving in general. Intelligence has thought of itself as in, the, as in the business of producing exquisite analytic products, and we'll still continue to do that for as far as the eye can see. It seems to be increasingly we're moving in a kind of client service direction. I would worry about that if we were going to get too far, but we're not in any danger of that. So moving in that direction, uh, I think, is part of intelligence in a more transparent world. Already, I did some work before I came to the NIC on the, the use of the President's Saving Brief over the last three administrations before the Obama administration. <coughs> and all the senior policymakers that uh, testified on the point liked the brief, but they liked the briefer better. <laughs> and, uh, the briefer was an entree to a conversation, an ongoing conversation. And that, I think, is true. I, by the same token, I think that uh, the one insight I had when I was the Nick last time was 
uh, I finally realized that we think of national intelligence estimates as our product, and really the product is national intelligence officers, people would be in a position to impart advice, give advice, and in conversation they don't have to be so, so careful about what's intelligence and what's policy. They can give advice, they can give their best judgment. Uh, and that I think is, is important, it's a, it is a, another harbinger of the, of the future. Finally, as Nigel said, the other part of the more transparent world is that uh, intelligence is going to be used more often in the policy debate. It's going to be cited more often. Presidents are going to want to turn to it, as they sometimes have in the past, justify what they're doing. Uh, that does impose a whole set of challenges. It makes it all the more important for us to continue to cling to what I, I'm impressed as a, as a powerful professional ethos, and that is we, we really are trying to uh, discover the truth as best we can. Uh, we're not uh, advocates. We don't have an agenda. Also, people always think everybody has an agenda, of course. But on the whole, intelligence doesn't. And trying to maintain that role in a period when there will be much more transparency about our products, that too will be an interesting challenge. Let me stop there and open it up, Nigel. Thank you. Well, Gregory, thank you very much. That uh, you covered a lot of ground uh, very succinctly. Um, but what um, you know, uh, impressed me perhaps most was that uh, your your approach was encouraging the optimistic and upbeat about uh, the prospects for the future. The message I take away from this is that uh, intelligence, in the sense that we we've, we've known it, uh, does seem to be here to stay and to have a future despite the challenges uh, to which you um, alluded. Um, so, um, I'll now open the floor for questions. Could you please catch my eye, and when I uh, identify you, could you please, uh, for, the, for the record, tell us, uh, tell us uh, who you are? And I'll start uh, in the uh, front row with the two gentlemen on my far left. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, please wait for the microphone. Thanks. Uh, and that's very much on my mind. I'm at the Wilson Center now. Uh, Greg, it, it, an excellent uh, survey of your work is uh, what I would expect. Uh, the, key question, uh, the key question that will uh, occupy our policy makers, not to mention our public, and, and, not, and not to mention our Congress, will be the impact of an agreement with Iran. Uh, the estimate on Iran will be a critical uh, piece, uh, and the officers uh, who put together the estimates on Iran will be high priority to uh, interrogate uh, and listen to, one hopes. Uh, what is the, uh, what are your plans for uh, the, the next two weeks? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you want to take that one first? Yeah, sorry, I'm a, uh, happily I'm not a RAND specialist, so the work will fall to my colleagues. Uh, obviously, we're, you know, we've been already doing lots of work on verification, what ifs, those kinds of things. That, that has been going on really since the beginning of the, the talks and probably before. We've also been doing a lot of work on implications of various possible scenarios for the region, and that work will continue. So what will you know, obviously intensify will be once we know more about an agreement, if there is one, then we'll be able to be more specific about the implications of that agreement for us understanding, being able to verify, but beyond verification, being able to uh, understand what we want to know about what the Iranians are up to. So that, those will be the main focal points moving forward. A lot of work already <coughs> done, a lot of good work, um, but it's obviously will get intense if, what, if we uh, see an agreement. Are you considering a uh, public sorry. version? Uh, so far, no. Mm -hmm. um, but. The debate, particularly with Congress, is bound to be intense, and so uh, that is something we'll have to keep in mind for sure. Okay. Bert White, uh, I've been working on intelligence 
off and on since 1962, but I was President Carter's special counsel for oversight of the entire intelligence community. Uh, Greg, uh, this is really not at the Director of National Intelligence um, level, but it's clear that the biggest news in regard to the community operation in recent months has been the announced change from the traditional division between the operators and the analysts at the CIA and regrouping into functional centers like the terrorist center. And as you know, the traditional concern going back to the Bay of Pigs claim that it would be followed <coughs> by an uprising against Castro was that the reports the operators were turning over to the DDI were biased because of their operational involvement. And when we looked at it during the church committee, there was also some concern by analysts that if they knew more about the operational circumstances, they could better assess the reports from the DDO. Uh, but I'm wondering, even though it's a fait accompli, if you could comment at all about that, perhaps what you said about uh, the timing pressures now affecting the traditional cycle makes uh, the joinder of them in operational centers almost a requirement. But I'm wondering if you could comment on that. Sure. Uh, the, the creation of the centers is interesting. And it, you know, there, there have been centers in intelligence uh, for a long, long time, as Bert says. Uh, they do tend to provide that focal point, which is what they're meant to do. Uh, it's always struck me as slightly odd that intelligence at this point in history is organized on the collection side by source and on the analytic side by agency. So that doesn't seem quite right. And the centers do provide that focal point. Uh, they also provide, as you suggest, uh, the opportunity at least for analysts to know more about at least one set of sources, one, one source of information. The, the concern, there is the, there is the concern about, uh, about the effect on analysis of being located directly with the operators, and that I think is, is, is a perennial. For me, my main concern, as you can imagine, is slightly parochial, but I think important, and that is we know from previous experience that the centers tend to be dominated by operators, by operations, and tend to be pretty short term in their time horizon. So the last thing I would like is a CIA that is less engaged in strategic analysis than it is now. Uh, nothing prevents the uh, center directors, particularly those who are directing geographic centers, from walling off a strategic analytic capability. And I hope that happens. We'll we'll see. It's going to be interesting to watch. As one of my colleagues said the other day, it'll be fun when performance appraisal time comes around and the director of the Russia Eurasia Center, who's a female analyst, gets to write the par for the Moscow station chief. This, this will be an interesting time. We'll see how that, uh, how that shakes out, but it, uh, it's going to be interesting to watch. I mean, if, if I can perhaps abuse the chairman's role and uh, intersperse some comments based on my own experience here, as, as you may recall, after the uh, Iraq invasion in 2003 and the political furore that uh, consequent upon the failure to discover significant quantities of WND, the British uh, government commissioned a report by Sir Robin Butler looking at uh, you know, um, the, the, how this had come to be. And he came up with some recommendations, one of which was criticizing the fact that my former service, SIS, had gone that route of uh, creating task forces in which operators and uh, reports officers were in the same teams and arguing that this was you know, kind of a, uh, a perversion of the traditional uh, process. And my job when I became the director of operations was to implement the Butler re you know, recommendations, which we accepted in full and committed to. And well, the interesting thing for me was that I found that actually there, there, there was in practice very little to do because when I looked at the sort of quality and objectivity and integrity of the reporting that we had produced, it stacked up pretty well. And there were all sorts of good reasons why the task force approach uh, in which you had a, a group of people with a collective ownership and responsibility for serving, you know, resolving a set of uh, intelligence problems actually worked rather well. 
So I think you know, the, my experience is that this is a matrix that never stays in, in, in one uh, configuration like any other matrix one, 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 one finds in life. It shifts to some degree in accordance with the nature of the problems you're trying to face. Yeah, right, uh, sir, yeah, um, yeah, um, uh, third row, the gentleman in the middle there. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll get everybody, but uh, yeah, bear with me. Thank you, Matteo Faini with the New America Foundation and Princeton University. I have a follow-up on, on the point you just made. It seems to me that the concerns for analytical objectivity are well raised. If we look at what the, the kind of analysis that the Center for uh, that the Counterterrorism Center has made in the past dozens of years or so, we see that on the drone strikes they came up with very very rosy reports. The one that said no civilian casualties, and then they had to backtrack. And the latest. Senate uh, report on, on CIA interrogations was, wasn't right on every point, but at least some points were agreed by the CIA itself. They did admit that they did mislead policymakers on whether Abu Zubaydah had really provided information after being <coughs> subject to interrogations, or on the Karachi plots in the consulate. So it does seem like this concern is there. If so, do you think that there is a space for the Office of the Director of National Intelligence for the NIC to actually step up and provide the kind of objective long-term analysis that the CIA may not be able to provide in the way it has in the past. Well, I hope so. That is, I, I take to be our, our main mission, uh, and uh, we'll obviously do that as best we can. I think the concern is fair enough, the concern about the, the implications for analysis of being closely connected to operators. That's a, that's a fair concern and is one everybody needs to be mindful of. It does suggest, as you suggest, the need to occasionally have some, some checks. And when we face it, it's a perennial in, for instance, places like Afghanistan, right, where, uh, not surprisingly, the military people on the ground doing training are likely to be pretty rosy about their work. They're likely to think we're doing a good job, we're training lots of people, and so their estimates are likely to be pretty rosy. Uh, and in those cases, it's uncomfortable but, but important for intelligence analysts back in Washington to be raising questions. I mean, yeah, the program is going well, but are you really, what, is the, what really is the significant effect in terms of, say, the capacity of the uh, Iraqi security forces to really fight? Uh, so that, that, uh, that's built into lots of relations between intelligence and policy. It sometimes gets nasty, uh, but mostly not, and mostly it's, it's an important part of having intelligence as a kind of check or second look at, at operations. Okay. Uh, gentlemen there, um, third row again. Thank you. Thank you, Ron Marks, former CIA. How are you doing? One of the issues that Nick has had to deal with over this process issue has been one of warning. And the warning issue has either been resting with an NIA who does such thing or it's been interviewing control with the individual NIAs. I was wondering if I talk a little bit about that. Warning is always whether you hear air of spraying or others. We didn't get a warning in advance. How is the NIC and how are you trying to deal with this issue today? Good question. I, I wish I knew the answer. This is very much a work in progress. Uh, maybe it always will be. We did. There was a national intelligence officer for warning. That was disestablished. I rather liked oh. the national intelligence officer for warning. Uh, I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to get permission to recreate it. But, um, I rather liked it because it was a second look. It seems to me, if you think about, I think about intelligence as about storytelling. Uh, it's about creating and adjusting stories in the heads of people that have to act. Uh, and what warning does, in my view, is provocatively challenge the prevailing story. We know from study after study that the subject matter experts find it almost impossible to think of discontinuities. They're so steeped in what is that thinking about something different is almost impossible for them. So um, what you need is some second look, some check. And that second look can be just a fresh look. Sometimes it can be uh, different data. Sometimes it can be method. The intelligence community has uh, created a prediction market. You've probably seen some of the press about it. The NIC is going to take it over in the next year or so. And I want to use it <clears throat> precisely as a kind of second look. You know, you say, say to an expert, if the prediction market says the probability of this happening is on balance 50% <coughs> and you think it's 30%, what's the difference? Why have that kind of conversation? And that's the, <clears throat> the 
sort of conversation that warning, I think, should enable. It should provocatively challenge the story and open the conversation to what if and why not. But what typically happens <clears throat> in intelligence failures is the, the story gets so firm uh, and goes unchallenged in ways that then lead to mistakes. So the obvious case was the one we know best, WMD. Uh, everybody, or nearly everybody, including folks like me that opposed the war, uh, thought, yes, Saddam has weapons of mass destruction. And when everybody thinks the same thing, it's all the more imperative for somebody to challenge it. Unfortunately, all the less likely that someone will. In, maybe that's a pathological case, but in less, less pathological cases, the challenge for us is to create those second looks that will provocatively challenge the prevailing story. Exactly how to do that uh, is something we're very much in the middle of thinking about now. Uh, we probably won't recreate a national intelligence officer for warning, um, but exactly how we'll do this is, uh, is, is up in the air at the moment. Thank you very much. Okay, um, the lady in the fourth row, fifth row, sorry, uh, and then we'll keep it in the fifth row. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Prescott, and I've uh, had the opportunity of serving on both sides of uh, I'm currently in the State Department, so I'm a policymaker. Uh, so I'm a consumer, but in a previous incarnation, I'd also um, generated and been in the IC in the past. Um, and my question is one about the changing nature of information. Because it used to be that it could be contained and it could be sourced, and if you put bright people in a room, you could come up with a good enough answer. Um, there are many more bright people all over the world that we could be leveraging, but we choose to have an artificial hurdle of clearances where we lock smart people in a room and sort of restrict them from engaging, quite frankly. Um, how do we change so that we know policymakers are getting the best possible information that exists, not just what the people in the room that have gotten clearances can come up with? And, and I don't, you know, looking at you know, military balance, which is a phenomenal investment that, that has uh, been generated over a long period of time with, with a lot of um, effort. I, it strikes me that, you know, does the IC really need to replicate things internally or do, do does there need more an effort of interpreting other people's products from academia or think tanks or individuals on the ground and then digesting those for policymakers and putting maybe a little bit of the classified in there, but, but really focusing more on leveraging the analytic capability outside of the IC and the U.S. government. Yeah, that's a, it's a really important point and one that's uh, frustrated and intrigued me my entire career because there is so much expertise out there. The one advantage of the NIC, couple of advantages of the NIC is that we are more open. I think we ought to be the most transparent, the most open, the most reaching out. Our Global Trends series bespeaks that because if you're trying to look out more than a couple of years, then all those secrets on your computer don't help you very much. What helps you with being out there talking to experts, even non-experts, talking to a wide range of people. And so the Global Trends exercise lets us do that, encourages us to do it. But it's also important, not just for Global Trends, but for all the way we do our work. Uh, and I'm struck by the difference across accounts. You know, for my NIO for WMD, the secret sources matter a lot. For the National Intelligence Officer for Economics, hardly at all. Right. Uh, so her challenge is reaching out, and, and there are differences. Same token, my international intelligence office for Africa um, has to reach out because the NGOs are always going to know more about African countries than than, um, than we will. Uh, I, to be, I'm alternately discouraged and, and uh, encouraged. The discouraging part is every time Snowden or something like that happens. Then the walls go up, the bars go up, and it gets harder to reach out. Um, now I think if you're a regular CIA analyst, even calling your former professor to talk with him or her is not easy. You have to go through some chain of approval. Um, that's the discouraging part. The encouraging part struck me when I was at the NICA last time. We were going to do a uh, paper. I wanted to do an estimate, but couldn't get my boss to make it an NIE. Uh, on humanitarian emergencies. And so we wanted to kick it off with a meeting with the main humanitarian NGOs here in Washington. Uh, and so we approached them. They 
didn't much like the idea. They didn't like the government much, and they didn't like intelligence uh, at all. But in the end, they were swayed because we cared about their issues. They all came. They wrote a two-page paper. And in fact, they sort of wrote the first draft of our paper. Uh, so it is, it is possible. You can reach out. You have to be careful, obviously. But uh, there's so much out there. And we do uh, we used to joke uh, when I was thinking before that sometimes outsiders did better than insiders because the outsiders weren't denied access to open source. It's <laughs> 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 an ongoing continuous challenge. I, um, I feel in that sense uh, especially happy to be at the NIC since I, I find us constrained enough, but at least we can usually work through the hoops to be able to, to reach out in almost all the ways we want. Thank you, and thank you for the endorsement on the military balance, by the way. <laughs> yeah. to take the next question in the same road. Oops. Frank Omar, um, political officer at the Embassy of Hungary. Uh, I wonder if you could comment on two actual uh, political hot uh, button uh, political issues. Um, Probably not, but, <laughs> <laughs> but try. Right, but let me, let me try anyway. Uh, one would be uh, providing the so called lethal assistance to the Ukraine. Uh, you just talked about the pros and cons a little bit. And the other would be um, the capacity of Afghan national security forces to, um, to sustain their. their combat power uh, after 2016, uh, provided, of uh, the rest of the resistances, which I think to fall uh, significantly. Thank you. Oh, sure. Happy to say a bit about both. Uh, as you know, there is a, as I've seen in the press, there, uh, there's a lively debate inside the administration about what kind of aid to, to, uh, to provide for Ukraine. Um, as you can imagine, there, the arguments against it are of two sorts, right? Uh, both have something to do with intelligence, but are, but are essentially policy arguments. They really are. Uh, would doing so escalate, cross some line in Putin's mind that would be more dangerous than helpful? And the other is more an operational, and that is, um, could, could anything we do be done quickly enough to make a difference? Essentially, would it make a difference? Uh, so that's the state of the, the, I think, the arguments against. Um, on Afghanistan security forces there. I'll echo what uh, my boss, Jim Clapper, said when he was testimony for Congress. Uh, they're doing OK now, but, of course, but they're very dependent on external aid. Indeed, almost absolutely dependent on external aid. So that does raise big questions about happen, what happens after 2016. Well, they're obviously also in play as getting to 2016 and beyond. There are issues still connected with, with that. So. Um, the, the, I think the base assessment is that they're doing okay, but very dependent on outside assistance. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, if I can indulge in a bit of product placement, there is a double IWS Adelphi called uh, Afghanistan to 2015 and beyond, which looks in you know, pretty extensive detail at this. So if you're interested, uh, I'm sure we can uh, make available a copy. Right, I'm going to go further back. So a couple of gentlemen uh, by the camera there, we'll take them. Uh, um, yeah, um, thank you. Right. Great. Tim Nelson, uh, State Department. I wonder if you could comment on, over the past year, one of the critical issues has been identifying Russian military troops or military uh, intelligence officers beforehand uh, active in Ukraine, warning about it, and then identifying has been very slow. And I think to this day, we're not identifying Russia as the belligerent. Uh, can you comment about, uh, is that an intel issue, uh, or is that a policy? What, where is the division the there? Uh, the intel piece of that is obviously identifying as best we can what the provenance of particular units, maybe even particular people. As one uh, DI analyst said, one, said once to me, he said, Selfies are our best friend. That <laughs> was the counterpart to that is boys will be boys, right? Yeah. So they're likely to take uh, their pictures in interesting places, never mind whether or not they should. Yeah. Right. So that, that's the intelligence piece. And I, I think we're, we're working pretty hard on that. The NGA, the, the imagery agency, has done a lot of good work. So that's the intelligence piece. And then 
what to say about it, uh, how much to say about it, that's obviously a policy question, not an intelligence one, but we're, it's obviously something we're very seized of and, and working on. Okay, next question, uh, yep. Thank you, Paul. Paul Joel uh, from NSI. It's kind of a follow-up question in a way. I'm interested in, uh, from your perspective, um, the challenges faced by I would what we call hybrid warfare, or maybe the larger perspective of information warfare, or what we used to call in the old days active measures, where you have the full gamut of covert action forces, uh, so-called little green men, all the way through what we're adding now, uh, influence operations. Uh, and cyber to the equation. There appears to be a lack of, I would say, um, an adequate response from the NATO community as to what we do in the face of this challenge. In previous, when I was in the government, in the old days, in the Reagan time, you know, we had a number of, of, uh, of uh, tools that could be used against active measures from the public side to the private side. So I would like to get your perspective on what we are doing now to better respond to the challenges. And of course today you have RT, you have a lot of different resources that per permeate uh, throughout the West. I would I'd be very interested in hearing your comments on that. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. It's, a, it's a, for me a really big issue. I mean, I think the whole nature of warfare is changing in pretty dramatic ways. and something I particularly want to, to focus on in the next global trends. But obviously, it's a day-to-day -day issue as well. In that sense, the Russia-Crimea case is, is, is interesting and provocative because it does combine many of these elements, right? It combines the little green men, it has some aspects of traditional military force, it, it has an it influence operation. Mostly Putin's approach to the media has been pretty old-fashioned. That is, we close it, buy it, or subord it. Uh, but he has used some, the Russians have used some social media. Uh, so it's an interesting combination of hard and soft power, my former colleague Joe Nye's terms. Uh, and I think trying to understand it is, uh, is, is certainly our task, and to help, therefore to help you know, our policy counterparts do better in countering it. It's pretty stunning to me how successful Putin has been in creating a narrative that is widely accepted in Russia and is 180 degrees different from what you and I think, believe, perceive about those issues. Um, so that's a pretty impressive achievement in a period when we think, well, everything flows across the globe, flows across borders easily. So it's, a, it's an interesting and provocative case, I think, for us to try and learn from. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we take the front row now. Um, uh, two two questions in the front, and then two ringers here, so yeah, and then two at the back, and that's probably all we're going to have time for. But uh, let's see how we go. I'll, I'll let Bob be the last ringer. <laughs> um, Greg, can you tell us who you are? Sorry, Andrew Pierre, now with Global Insights, um, and with Greg when he was at ISS before. Um, I'd like to ask you about intelligence cooperation with allies, but it may surprise you that I'm not particularly interested or focused on the British and the French and the Germans. You began by saying how the Middle East occupies much of your time for very good reasons, ISO and so on. And there are other intelligence capabilities, some with countries we don't particularly like or have mixed feelings about, Jordanians, <coughs> I would guess we have some intelligence cooperation with, but then there's countries like uh, Egypt, even Saudi Arabia, um, Israel, perhaps the United Arab Emirates, and so on. And these countries, I would guess, have a particular feel, right or wrongly, for um, non-state actors and for the sort of confused uh, billiard ball table situation we have in the Middle East. So my question is, do we, have we expanded our intelligence cooperation with these countries in order to um, understand um, the Middle East better? I guess I would throw in there, if I may, uh, the impact of Snowden uh, on the British and French and Germans and the Russians, as a matter of fact, and how lasting that impact has been. 
This could take us to dinner. Yeah. I want to. <laughs> I always see intelligence cooperation mostly through analysis, not through collection. Uh, it's always the case that given the hardness of the targets in the Middle East, we're more and more dependent on liaison with some of the countries you mentioned. That's just a fact of life. And so I imagine, presume those relationships are continuing to grow. Uh, on the analytic side, I'm struck by uh, how we just did an exchange in January with our Indian counterparts in Delhi with the Joint Intelligence Committee there. And it was really very interesting, very interesting. We sort of focused on our comparative advantage. We talked mostly about the Middle East. They talked mostly about their neighborhood. As you can imagine for them, every issue came back to either China or Pakistan or both. Uh, but it was interrupted because you know, I don't think much about Myanmar. And there isn't a lot of good press coverage of Myanmar except when there's some protests. So it was a very, I thought, instructive and useful exchange and, and made me think that we, we've done a similar thing with the Italians. They also have an interesting perspective. So I, have, I see this mostly through the, the prism of, of analysis and want us to do more and more of that. We have lively debates all the time with the Australians. The Brits we've talked to, and we talk, obviously talked to the Brits. We have a BTC with our counterparts in, in London every, every week about some set of issues. So that's intense. But I'm struck by how much, if you talk to the Australians, they have interesting things to say about China. They probably know Indonesia better than we're ever going to know it. Right? And so those, I think those contacts are useful. Um, Snowden has had a powerful effect on intelligence across the board. I think it hasn't uh, much affected. It's affected more the, the willingness of the private sector to cooperate with us than it has the relations between us and uh, other services. Around, around the world. Germany is a special case because it's been such a public and, um, and big deal in, in Germany. OK, thank you. Uh, one more in the front, and then uh, Sam at the back. Two, two gentlemen there, and then I think we'll have to close the, uh, the, 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 the batting. Uh, thank you, Robert Hunter, Center for Transatlantic Relations and a ringer. Uh, having been a customer of, of the Nick product for more than a decade in various jobs. Uh, I have a very high regard for it, and delighted, Greg, that you're doing this job with your background and, and uh, uh, your talents. Uh, you've identified the problem of how you get from product that you have into the minds and the activities of, of customers who have a day-to-day -day responsibility which is magnified in a media-dense world where they're being pressed all the time. and. Uh, and uh, may not want to, uh, to hear a longer range perspective. I was also pleased to hear you say that you're trying to get into some of the strategic thinking of relating apples to oranges. Uh, in my judgment, the great failings of American foreign policy over about two decades now, uh, Republicans and Democrats, has been that we haven't done the fundamental strategic thinking that is required in the post-Cold War period where our influence, frankly, is less because we don't have a single peer competitor, et cetera. The uh, question is, even if you folks can do some of this work, because you don't have to meet a payroll every moment, how do you find uh, customers willing to listen? How do you crack through it? How do you get us to the point where we actually will start to put together some of these things? Uh, for example, we have never explained what we're trying to do in uh, in Afghanistan. We seem not to relate the different parts of the Middle East to one another. We seem not to be able to say, we're going to confront Russia here, we're going to have to confront, uh, cooperate with Russia there, and a whole series of other things. How, maybe not for this administration, but if you were designing this and had a chance to hire everybody and coach the next president to say, how do we get ourselves into the game where the capacities of the United States can be used effectively in a strategic way, not just the day-to-day -day nuts and bolts. Yeah. Let me give you uh, two answers. One is sort of half one is called only half. I didn't, uh, uh, haven't done any of the global trends before, but I, when I was at the bank the last time, I played some role in conceiving the idea. And uh, one of the things I understood about Washington was that uh, if, we, if we gave this two-decade look the policy people, they'd say thank you and never read it. Uh, so the key was getting press. If we got some press attention, 
then policymakers would turn to their special assistants and say, what the heck is the NIC up to? What is this, right? And we get some attention that way. And that, that I think, has actually worked rather well. Uh, it takes some basic understanding of Washington to make it happen, but it does. What we've done, more, more serious answer is, what we've tried to do with, with the Global Trends product is then pull it back. Pull it back to a time horizon that's a couple years, not a couple decades. A time horizon that would be of maybe of interest to first NIOs, the National Intelligence Officers, and then their policy counterparts. And that has been, a, um, again, it's a, at this point more, more of an objective than a completion, but we've turned it into a couple of more strategic, one a kind of a hot spots document, and another is a kind of more strategic look out, uh, six months to a year. Um, and those we've done, developed in collaboration with the NSC and the NSC staff, um, going in the right direction. But that's the, that's what I think, that, that's the, the best I think we can do is to try and reach out to those that, the planners and others in different parts of the government that may be inclined to take a slightly more comprehensive, maybe even a slightly longer look, and hope that we can kind of smuggle it in that way. Because we know that really busy seniors are always going to say, yeah, I want to do this, but it won't happen. <coughs> when I was at the NIC before, we had a great idea. We thought we would take, tee up an issue. We'd get the policy planning staff and the State Department write a two-page appraisal of the issue. we do a two-page intelligence understanding. we then convene the deputies committee informally over lunch, and we have a conversation that started, well, where would we like this to be in 10 years? And then peel back the issue to the present. Great idea, got on the calendar once, once. Uh, so it is the challenge. Okay, we'll take the last two questions that are in you. I sat chair up and the gentleman right at the back, and I'll take them together if that's all right. Thanks, uh, Sam Chair of the White of Lutz, senior fellow for Russia Asia here. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask about your third strategic priority, you said Europe. Uh, if you could elaborate a little bit more on that, what you had in mind. Okay, and the, yeah. Uh, Charles Gotti Seitz, Johns Hopkins. Uh, nice to see you. Uh, the, the, the question has to do with uh, your assessment, without revealing <laughs> secrets here, of, of uh, the information that was given to policymakers prior to Russian aggression. Uh, against Crimea. <coughs> Are you satisfied that we knew uh, in advance of what was happening? Forgive me for uh, ducking that last question. The answer is I, I, I don't know. I wasn't yet back in the government, so I, uh, I didn't live through it from inside the government, so I, uh, I, just, I just don't know. Um, my sense from outside was that um, it's not entirely clear that while well, Putin had intentions and maybe some designs, I not clear to me, wasn't clear to me from outside that he had plans. So, um, you know, the, I put that in the mystery category, mystery, mysteries being those intelligence problems for which there is no answer because they depend, they're contingent. And so I would put their, his decision on that regard into the mystery category. But the honest answer is I, I just don't know. I haven't looked back at it. On Europe, I'm, uh, as you know, I'm a lapsed Europeanist. I was really pleased when the Cold War ended because quite apart from anything else, it was pretty boring. It was getting very boring. Uh, and uh, then after that, I wasn't interested in Europe so much. But now I'm getting interested again because I think so much is going on. There are so many sources of uncertainty. We know the Eurozone crisis is not over. Uh, we've seen, in some ways, Europe the prisoner of its own success. As long as it holds together, then Catalonia and Scotland don't need Britain or Spain. We'll see more of that. Uh, more to the point, though, is we are now in a period when all of us thought that Europe was an expanding zone of peace, and uh, turns out to be not quite, not yet. And so dealing with uh, Russia, Putin, Putinism, um, it's not clear to me that the Europeans have quite understood yet that this is a uh, it's not just Ukraine. This is going on. This is going to be a continuing pattern of, of Russian behavior, and probably even beyond Putin. It's a very hard set of issues on which to make policy, because in the long run, we know Russia is a failing state. 
And as far as I can tell, everything Putin is doing is hastening its demise. But as they say, in the long run, we're all dead. Uh, and so the next uh, uh, few years are going to be a rocky and challenging road. This in a period when uh, European capabilities are going down, not up. Uh, so that, that makes me, that, that, that's why I, I want to pay attention and worry some about Europe. Okay, well, uh, great. thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid we're going to have to uh, draw a halt to these proceedings. I sense we could carry on for an awful long time. But I'd just like to say thank you for, for, Greg, for covering uh, a very wide range of topics. And um, I'm glad to get your endorsement of China, cyber, and Europe as your three key priorities, given that two of them are the ones I concentrate on in IISS, and the third is where I live at least until the United Kingdom referendum. Thank <laughs> you.